everyone, my name is Hannah and you're listening to the Let's Talk About It Brunel Student Wellbeing and Mental Health Podcast. So today we've got a really interesting topic and I'm so excited to introduce our guests. Do you mind introducing yourselves? So hi everybody. Uh, so I'm Zoe Kata and um, I'm part of an organisation called CB Plus and we work in the community uh, with people and with organisations. But I'm part of the Young People Thrive team. And what we do is support the mental health and well-being of young people aged 17 to 25. And um, we support them with strategies, skills, helping them to understand what's going on and hopefully support them to live healthier lives. But today we're here to talk about um, eating disorders. And so we'll be talking a bit more about a program called Food and Me. And Hi, I'm Terry Dovey. Uh, I'm head of life sciences here at Brunel. Um, but more importantly, I'm a long time advocate, lecturer, done some work in for about 25 years in eating disorders um, and particularly inside uh, ARFID, which is avoidant restrictive food intake disorders amongst pediatrics um, rather than uh, in the adult services. <laughs> so we've got some overlap there, Zoe, haven't we? We've got we some do with indeed. The, but uh, I tend to work with the under fives, sometimes under sevens. Um, I imagine yours are a bit older. Yes, I'm a bit older, um, but we do work with parents as well. Yeah. So then that comes into the age range that you work with. So it's it's a really, you know, broad spe spectrum in terms of who we work with and how we work. Yes. Yeah, so um, I'm really excited to discuss our topic today. I think it's a topic that's quite relevant to today's society and it's about body image and eating disorders and how they sort of can, you know, integrate with each other and what what connections there are between them. Um, I think especially in this day and age where there's uh, the rise of social media, Photoshop being almost unidentifiable when people use it, it can lead to people um, struggling with their um, the way they perceive themselves. And that's where the body image comes in. Um, but I wanted to first get into what is an eating disorder. So do you mind just telling me, is it the same as disordered eating? Are they the same things or are they different? Okay. Um, <laughs> So what is an eating disorder? Um, firstly, that most eating disorders or not all eating disorders have got nothing to do with eating. Um, so they're all kind of overlap by the fact you're putting something or not putting something in your mouth. Uh, and that's why they're called eating disorders. You've got a variety of them. So um, typically we diagnose them with uh, is PICA, rumination syndrome, um, anorexia, nervosa, bulimia nervosa, uh, and then you've got your avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. Um, and then after that, you've got other specified eating disorder, um, which is anything that's related to eating, but doesn't fall into the other categories. Um, so that's the yeah. typical group. Most people have heard of anorexia and bulimia. Uh, a few people are starting to hear about um, uh, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, yeah. but I think fewer probably know about rumination disorder and PICA. Maybe what exactly do. is rumination disorder? So rumination disorder is uh, a, it, it's named after ruminants as in cows, goats, that kind of thing. And it's the same kind of process. So someone will consume food and then a little bit later will uh, have a gentle burp and the food will return to their mouth. They'll then typically either take it out and hide it somewhere or they'll reach you and swallow it. Um, it's most common in folks that uh, have learning disabilities, but that's probably because those are the most observed groups of people. Yeah. Um, it, we don't know how common it is in the general population uh, and it's very much related to emotional distress, emotional trauma. Um, so the more emotionally distressed you are and the most, more emotional trauma you have, the more likely you are to be ruminating. Um, but yeah, that if, if you think about it in terms of reflux that people have heard about, it's like more an extreme form of reflux. Yeah. I think people will know um, Reflex is very, very common, especially as you get a bit older. Um, and um, it's, yeah, so those kind of similar outcomes, uh, those kinds of, if, you, if you're stressed and you've got a particularly stressed workload, your reflux will typically get worse. Mm -hmm. um, and then just think of it in the context of, uh, instead of bringing up 
bile or small amounts of stomach juices, which is reflux, you'll bring up the whole food, which is right. rumination. Okay. Um, well, one of the things that I love about this podcast is I, I always say that we're trying to normalize conversations that need to be normalized. Um, and we've talked about like a lot of different things in the past. We've talked about um, disability and dyslexia, men's mental health. Um, in the future, we're going to be doing equality, diversity, inclusion. Um, but I mean, in terms of uh, eating disorders, are there certain things that can make you more, I guess, prone to having it? Is there certain things that can make you um, more likely to have an eating disorder? Any risk factors, anything that people need to look out for? Um, a very good question. And I, I'll, I'll come at it from the angle of some of the communities and people we work with. And so just to give a bit of background, um, the focus of our work is with um, members of the BAME community, and that will include people from um, maybe asylum seeking, mm. refugee communities, and my, uh, people who may be first or second generation um, uh, residents within within this um, this part of the world, and also people who may be carers and um, at the LGBTQ community. And what we, we tend to find from the feedback we get is that when, um, for instance, families are struggling, especially now, mm. where we've got a cost of living crisis and we've had the um, aftermath of, of COVID and we're still living with that, some of the stresses that come from these experiences and also the limited budgets that families have yeah. mean that they, they aren't able to maybe buy the foods that they are familiar with. They aren't living in spaces where they can cook the foods that they are familiar with. They're not also able to practice some of the cultures and, 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 and um, cultural practices and sometimes faith practices. And therefore this impacts on the food they eat, and that can lead to eating disorders because, or disordered eating. I think mm -hmm. eating disorders is probably much further ahead because you might find that families are cooking with very limited um, uh, budgets. They're not cooking the foods they like. They're not cooking, their children may not like the foods they're eating. And so children start to develop habits yeah. around food. Families also start to develop habits around the food and that we are finding that from the feedback we get from the people we we talk to in our work are expressing that these potentially are leading to their relationship with the food they're having and could lead on to um, eating disorders. So from our perspective, these are some of the yeah. um, stories we are hearing people sharing with us about what right. could be help, um, impacting on, on, yeah. on their I mean, relationship with food. I mean, I'm a psychology student, so I remember like reading, and I think also remembering in first year, we were taught that there were certain personality traits that can make you more prone to it. And I remember like we were talking about neuroticism and um, also gender. Um, do you mind saying a little bit more about that, about certain things that can be contributing to that? Sure. So, um, yeah, the variety of personality attributes have been associated with different eating disorders. Um, the obvious one is the neuroticism because that's sim similar you're talking about there, Zoe, in terms of anxiety and stress. And the more neurotic you are, the more likely you are to experience or, or, uh, higher levels of stress um, against everyday hassles. Um, but um, th then there's, there's aspects uh, related to perfectionism. Um, people, uh, and that typically stems from uh, a thought process around rigidity. So it, things have to be a certain way, otherwise not interested or can't really engage with it or they, or in some cases of the, of the lesser known eating disorders so become a bit more disgusted. Is it less to do with being perfectionist in the idea of like looking a certain way is more about having a certain way of doing things, not everything. Looking. Okay. So everything from the way your room's organized to the rituals around food, which is what you, I think you're highlighting mm -hmm. there, Zoe, in terms of um, some of those cultural practices around mm -hmm. food and, those, and sometimes ideologies around food as well. Uh, and that can come back from religious beliefs um, uh, and how you express yourself through food. And if you lose that, that can also be a bit of a risk factor as well. Um, uh, usually when you get to the more severe end of anorexia nervosa, for example, they're all 
majority are going to be vegan. They're all going to have high ritualistic behaviors around yeah. foods and how foods should be eaten and how it should be prepared, which is sort of an extension, if you like, of some of our other ritualistic, cultural, religious beliefs. Um, in terms of other personality attributes, uh, another one is alexithymia. Uh, that's really common in the more extreme eating disorders. Um, uh, that's pretty much the inability to understand your emotional state in yourself, but also notice it in other people. That tends to also be a bit of a problem too. Um, so they may misunderstand often, they'll, they'll view neutral faces, which I'm experiencing right now, lots of neutral faces, <laughs> um, as very angry faces. Um, and so that means that your interaction with, your, with the rest of society can be quite negative, even when it's actually not. And so you can see how people then go on to develop and see threat around you. Um, mm -hmm. And that's quite common. That's a common personality attribute, about 10% of people. I think it's mm -hmm. quite interesting, actually. Yeah. Um, so... We, I want to talk about common issues around this topic. Um, what are some of the common issues that you face in your role that you see that, you know, some people aren't as uh, likely to come and get help when they want to receive help or something that you see is quite a reoccurring issue? Is there anything that you've noticed? Um, yeah, I think what we are finding in, in the role, so I'll explain a bit about what we do. Mm. So there are two parts to, to the work we do. We deliver webinars on um, four main uh, topics, and I'll, I'll mention those later. And then um, we also go out into the community. We speak to young people, we speak to community members, professionals, um, and we also hold full course group discussions and we have an advisory group for people with lived experience. And what we are finding is um, when we speak to people, First of all, it's, oh, yes, it's about healthy eating. That's what we get. Mm. And then when we have the conversation, what actually do you mean by healthy eating? Oh, it's, you know, I'm eating my proteins. I'm eating a ba balanced diet. Um, and then we ask questions, especially where uh, English is a second language for some yeah. community members is, so have you had, do you know what an eating disorder is? And you might get draw a blank, you know, because what we're finding is that in some community languages, eating disorder, that there's no vocabulary for that. So it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So then we have to try and describe what we're trying to say, because we yeah. don't want to lead people. We want people to share their experiences. So we come across blank faces. We also come across people saying, like I said before, yes, it's about healthy eating. And then you do have people who will actually say, I'm really curious about this. I've, I'm reading your leaflet. It seems like some of these things you're talking about, my relationship with food. So we usually say we're talking about our relationship with food. We don't use the word eating disorders or, or two words. And then we give examples about you know, do you find yourself or do you know somebody in your life who is very particular, has to go to the gym X number of times, does this, you know, is not, you know, restricting what they eat, counting calories. And when we start to open up the conversation around this, then we are finding that people actually, these resonate, resonate with people. Yeah. But what we are finding is that we still, there's a lot of work to be done around um, the stigma associated with uh, disordered eating and eating disorders and um and le the link to mental health and well-being as well um so yeah i'll just pause and see maybe yeah i think you're right there's always a communication is really bad thing um generally because i think it's us academics get hold of something we come up with these really complex terms so what you highlighted there i would call orthonorexic tendencies does anyone even know what that means? Orthonorexic <laughs> tendencies. Um, so effectively, it means that taking away the nutritional value and adding in additional value. So you talked about health as one of them there. And do you understand what healthy eating is? Um, well, if you take that to a point where you're no longer consuming enough calories or, enough, or, or you're potentially over consuming vitamins and minerals through supplements and things like that, um, you've got an orthonorexic tendency. Um, 
now there are some people out there if you go and look, look in the literature that say about orthonorexia, orthonorexia nervosa mm. um, but I don't think it's really a, a thing insofar as um, it's probably related to other eating disorders and disordered eating <laughs> Um, but you can see how quickly, if I go up to someone and say, hmm, you've got orthonorexic tendencies, I think their first reaction is probably to try to slap me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so how do we get to communicate what are these high convoluting, very specific behaviors to folks in the community so they understand? Because I think that would probably also extend to things like anorexia. It, it, it would extend to, certainly extend to PICA and, um, and even... Arfid, if I go to someone to Arfid, they say, what? Mm. And it's like, well, your diet's really, really restricted and you're not gaining weight very well or you're gaining too much weight because you're only eating very few amounts of foods. Um, and you go, you have Arfid. And they go, oh, thanks for that. Yeah. Um, what do I do with it? Mm. And so what do we do with it? Mm. How do we communicate? How do you How do you communicate those high complex concepts to folks Often English is a second language. Yes, I th- that's a very good question because um, Sorry, I just I think... love that you did my role. <laughs> <I suppose. laughs> Sorry, <laughs> no, I probably would have come in there because I think you're ra- raising really important points. So we we stay clear away clear away from the descriptions and the jargon. What we are trying to do is to get people to think about what's happening with your body, what's happening with your experiences. And then we'll go to the label. Remember, we also have the webinars and that's where the technical information comes in. So mm. when we are having the, these conversations and we say, you know, so for instance, okay, Zoe, it sounds to me like what you're talking about um, could be that you need to find out more about what eating disorders or disorders eaters are. So why don't you come along to the webinar and speak to the experts? Because the, what I didn't see at the beginning is we are delivering this with Ori, who has a specialist eating disorder um, company. And that's what they do. That's yeah. their daily, you know, piecemeal. So we'll say, come to these. They are the experts. They, they, they are the therapists. They are the family practitioners. Come and listen. Come and find out for yourself or find out for your family member what is actually going on and then we signpost so we st- we do steer away from from using titles because we are very used to using titles and acronyms but then what do they mean yeah so we go down to basics what are your experiences it can also what be a bit intimidating in- right? exactly yeah. because mm. we try to be the community face the community member having these conversations or we have young people in our team. These are the young people talking to students. So we stay we stay away from jargons. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, we're talking about issues that can come up with this. I don't, I mean, I want to know your lots of opinions on this. Um, with social media, there's certain uh, people, influencers, you call them fitness influencers. I don't know if you've seen some of them, but they have some lewd, honestly, mental ways of, saying how you should eat. So some of them was the watermelon diet, which is just eat watermelons. What do you think about um, fitness influencers that do stuff like this? How do you think people can look for the right information? Where can they find the right information? Um, what can they do to prevent falling into these traps? Because a lot of them seem like they know their stuff and a lot of people follow them. So I remember when I was on my own health journey, uh, my brother was showing me this. He's like, oh, look at this. You should try this. I'm not eating eggs for a whole day. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all right. <laughs> so what do you think about that? <laughs> That's actually, um, that's a very good question. Um, and I think it's, it's what we, what do you do about that? I think it's quite, should I say dangerous for people yeah, to follow, yeah, yeah. follow that because you're absolutely right. And, you know, we are sitting here behind these mics and we're having this conversation. I can rock up in my little room and with the little information I have, start to talk about things and use my own personal experience. So what I would say to people is, um, and I've got two young people in my home mm. and I see them watching people on, on, on YouTube and what have, what have you. And what I would say to a parent or a young person is always check the facts. Yeah, It's all well and good watching these people, listening to them, but always look for a tangible um, reputed source of information 
Um, and if we are talking about eating disorders, BEAT is a very popular, well-established um, chari charitable organization. You can also speak to your GP, go to the NHS website, MIND. There are lots of spaces where if I hear something, check it out. That is that really true? Speak to somebody, Yeah, you know, you've got student services, have a chat with them. I heard this uh, person talking about this. I'm not sure. Get help and advice because what we, we, what we don't want to do is to go down this path path where we're actually living, um, reasonable, um, lives. And I'll, I'll just give a simple example because a colleague of mine from Ori mentioned this yesterday and it's about binge eating. And hopefully that will put this in context where, you know, I may be feeling a bit off in the evening and I may decide to have six biscuits digestives, but that's not what I do normally. And because I've been listening to somebody, like you said, mentioned the melon diet, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, you know, I'm binge eating. I need to go to the doctor to have a diagnosis. Blah, and then you just go down that spiral. Mm. Um, when I put this in context, maybe I've had a really poor day. I haven't maybe eaten well. Or I feel like having a sweet with a cup of tea. So I'm having this and I allow myself to have this and know that tomorrow I'm not going to do the same thing. Yeah. However, if I sit down and have six packets of biscuits in 30 minutes, then I should be concerned. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, you know, exactly. Six so packets, put things in context is what I would, yeah. I would say. Um, I mean, yeah, something, I mean, I spoke to you very briefly about this over email, but um, with my own experience coming from a more emotional perspective, um, I remember the kind of things that I used to do when I was a lot younger, um, trying to lose weight and be, a, be specifically a, a, a certain look I was going for. Um, and I remember thinking like, Looking back at it, I was losing myself. So it was, it felt like I had attended a hundred funerals in my lifetime and they were all my own. Like, I felt like I was grieving someone who wasn't actually gone and I was losing myself. And I realized that while I was doing this, a, a good way to think about it is if, if you were told to look after someone, would you give them what you gave yourself? Would you feed them the way you fed yourself? You are deserving of the love that you give to other people. You are worth more. You deserve more. Um, and I think that was really helpful to think of it in that way. I think that really helps. And I think it's 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 unfortunate that a lot of people feel like they have to look a certain way and be a certain way to fit into society. And that's just a never ending cycle. It just keeps going, to be honest. But um, no. yeah, so um, we want to talk about what resources are out there for people who have eating disorders. Um, so, so you work for Food and Meat Eating Disorders. Do you mind telling me a little bit about what they do and what they focus on? I mean, it's, it's talk, we'll talk about it a little bit, but just to give a bit more in-depth information on it. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. Um, Food and Me is um, a program for, um, it's for 16 to 25s. However, it's a family program as well. And it's a program funded by the North London Eating uh, Disorder Collaborative. And it focuses on um, looking at disordered eating and eating disorders from a culturally sensitive perspective. So it's looking at it from, as my colleague says, um, an anti-oppressive lens. You know, there's so many structures in our society that um, put limits on us. Um, we see different visuals and perceptions, as you said, as the way we should look, the way we should behave, the way we should eat. And there's so many pressures. So what we, what our program uh, focuses on is four main topics. And I'll just briefly say how this came about. This, so this program came about because there was a recognition that there were people, people living within our communities who, um, particularly from the BAME, meaning Black African Asian minority ethnic groups and other minoritized groups. So when we think about minoritized, we're thinking about those from the global South who wouldn't, for main, mainly wouldn't have English as a second language. And also carers, both adult and young carers, and also people from the LGBT community and the traveling community are uh, typically those who wouldn't seek help early. They may be struggling in silence. There may be cultural norms, familial norms that prevent people from getting help 
and also putting things off or it's just in your imagination, this whole stigma bit. So that's where this came about, where the typical image was the skinny white um, affluent girl. Mm. But we all know that that's not true. There are lots of young people who, you know, in the family, maybe the only one who is a bit on the the heavy side, um, it would be described as fat, but, but they're not fat, they just have a fiscal, uh, fiscally different. They may have a different color tone, some may be darker, and they may be the only one who's light or vice versa. So there are so many differences within, and that can influence how we eat and can lead to our relationship with food and our emotions, as um, was mentioned before, and therefore can lead to an eating disorder. Mm. So that's where this program came from. So what we do is um, we have four topics, introduction to eating disorders, which runs through the main topics just to raise awareness and get people to think and uh, seek help if they need it. The other one is the role of um, food in your culture. And so we're thinking about um, faith communities and different cultural practices and the different types of foods that we eat. And when we think about our children, what they eat in school versus what they eat at home. And then the next topic is around um, routine and structure. Again, going back to the family home, going back to the community. We've got, um, we're in Lent at the moment for those who are Christians. Um, we've got Eat coming up. We've got, um, it's a young couple or Passover coming up for the Jewish faith. Um, but there are different things coming up and it's a really critical time in families where families come together, food brings us together and it's being conscious. So th that's one of the topics we are covering, the role um, structure in, in the family. Yeah. And then the final topic in a couple of weeks is body image. Um, and that's speaking to social media, it's speaking to different influencers, it's speaking to different practices around um, fitness, around different aspects of our lives and how that impact impacts on our uh, um, perception of body image and what we do um, to keep the, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so we're talking about eating disorders, but we're also talking about body image. Um, what do you think about the role social media plays in how we perceive ourselves? Um, I mean, this is slightly not related to what you do, but what would you say, how does, how do you think that has an effect on, and then how can that contribute to people developing an eating disorder as well? Okay, good <laughs> question. Um, I think we have to first take away the blame game. We like to externalize blame. Um, and so there's lots of, um, it's media's fault. It's, um, you highlighted one of those, uh, the watermelon diet, the fitness influencers fault. Um, that, that's not new. I mean, if you look at it historically, ask your grandparents about the cabbage soup diet, ask your parents about pepper water. Um, they've, uh, and we could go back all the way back to 1920s, actually, when yeah. this started. Uh, and that's, um, again, it's, it's all what we call impression management and priming. Ooh, more com horrible words. Um, but impression management is just doing behaviors, actions um, to impress upon others. So we might adapt our behavior if we want to impress someone or if we want someone to go away. Um, and we do that all the time to signal all sorts of things. And we do it a lot in food. So you'll, you'll ha have a concept, I don't have to explain it to you, of masculine food and feminine food and when to eat in different situations to express whether you're exuberant or whether you're frugal or whatever it may be. You'll, you'll adapt your behavior that way around food. Um, but in the context of body image and the influences, what we have to look out for is also priming, right? The person themselves looks for that content, yeah. not the other way around. That, yeah. the, the influences, unless they are um, advocated for by a government agency of some kind, I think that's only ever happened once during COVID, where they advocated for that fitness guy, can't remember his name. <laughs> Um, Joe Wicks. That's the one <laughs> yeah. um, who, who, who was the only influence I'm aware of who's been forced upon us. <laughs> um, bless him. No, I, I, think he does, <laughs> I think he does brilliant work. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so ultimately, you, the, the person themselves goes looking for that content. So what, that's what we call priming. Yeah. 
So uh, those folks are looking for particular content. And then, of course, that's reinforced by the social media algorithms to show you more of that content. But you have to look for it in the first instance. You have to have that thought pattern. And of course, there'll be always people out there that want to sell you a product. Yeah. And if they can't sell you a product, they'll sell you a dream. And that's because you don't want to hear the reality. Do you know what? I think that's a really good point. I think um, what you look for, that is more of that will come up on your feed. Um, so whatever you're interested in, it's normally weaknesses that end up coming up, like your own stuff that you see yourself as like, you know, oh, I lack in this and that. And you may not, but that's the way you perceive yourself. Um, and you just, it's like a horror film where you sort of want to look when the scary parts come up, but you don't want to do it. Um, and some of it just ends up, just keeps coming up and up until you feel like you're pressurized. And then it, it forces you into certain things like even makeup products, um, you know, they tell you to buy a foundation, but they want you to buy the primer for the foundation. That's just a way for them to sell two products to you. <laughs> so it's just like this way of making you sort of fall into one thing, lead mm. to another, lead to another until you just sort of are in this endless cycle. Um, but yeah, I think that's quite interesting. Can I just start? Yeah. Um, so so you, you raised a very good point and, and I like the way you explained it. But... Um, and again, I agree that it's 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 not necessarily the social media. However, because we we relying more and more on media, on the internet, consciously or subconsciously, to find information for self gratification. Going back to the point that you know we find the information, and the information follows us. You know when we are thinking about the the work we do around um, the social movement and the engaging as a community is highlighting that fact and making, you know, letting people to reflect or helping people to reflect on, dare I say, the influence that social media has on us. Because I think we're not conscious that we control our social media because we are drawn into this. So, so it's almost like, I won't say chicken and egg, but there's probably a more apt description. You know, it's almost like one feeding the other. And so we keep going in this dance of recipro reciprocity, yeah. isn't it? You know, one feeding the other and it's the just doing in front. The blind leading the blind, if we want always to marketing. say that. It's, it's and always it's marketing. Being, exactly. It's so marketing it's being pounds. mindful. Yeah. It's mindful and, and taking a step back. Um and thinking, actually, is this helpful to me? If I'm looking for this information, yeah. shouldn't I be asking for help? Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So what would you say um, if you feel like someone is struggling with an eating disorder or they suspect that they are, what would you say are the first steps that they should take? It's quite a loaded question because it's quite difficult to put yourself in, <laughs> in those shoes. But what would you say? What would you recommend? Very good question, though, because you know, hopefully we'll find ourselves along people, you know, we may be struggling ourselves or we may find ourselves along somebody um, who's um, struggling. I think one of the key things is is being, listening to them. I think a lot of, from the feedback we get, a lot of people feel like they're not heard, they're not seen and are dismissed. So it's listening to the person, being that um, um, friend that walks alongside hear what they're saying, trying to understand, you know, so having that conversation without prying um, or interrogating, because sometimes when we're asking questions like, because maybe I'm anxious, I'm busy asking all these questions and my anxiety levels are going up and feeding that person. So it's really just being empathetic, listening, hearing what they're saying, checking in, your, checking your understanding of what they're saying and helping them to um, find um, a suitable um, help outside of yourself. If there's an organization, if there's somebody in their family they trust that they can speak to, if they don't have anybody in the family, who else within your circle of influence can you speak to? Speak to your GP, speak to um, a health professional, or get in touch with one of the organizations. Um, and thinking about the young people we work with, Young Minds is a really good site. Papyrus, if there's some form of suicide ideation or self-harm, is a really good resource to go to. I mentioned BEAT before. Your local mind. Um, and look look in your community and thinking about the student population. The Students' Wellbeing Service is always your 
yeah. first um, port of call and speaking to a fellow student. So I would say, listen, pay attention, um, walk alongside the person, don't push um, and help them through the process. Um, I mean, I think also something that really helps me was there, there's a book called Beauty Sick and that book was a really challenging read. It was really good, but it, it talked a lot about eating disorders and also body dis dissatisfaction. And I think it was, I recommend it to anyone who's listening. It, it's more, the, more, most of the studies she talks about are about women and women in today's society, but I feel like it's a good book for everyone and I'd recommend it to anyone. So if anyone's listening, I would say definitely check that book out because it, it was a good read. Um, do you have any last takeaway messages? Anything that you'd like to close up this podcast episode with? Sure. I've got what I think what Zoe said there is, is absolutely right. Break the social isolation. However, a lot of eating disorder conversations happen around adolescents, adults, and specifically anorexia. Uh, tends to dominate all conversations, all funding, all... Uh, and, it, and it's just the, the least common eating disorder. Um, so I would like to say a highlight and always have throughout my whole career um, is look out for the other eating disorders too, right? Because they happen in children. They happen in vulnerable people, pregnant women. PICA is very common in pregnant women. Um, uh, and uh, things that aren't so obviously seen. Um, and so binge eating disorder so I highlighted that one as well earlier. And I forgot to say that in my list of eating disorders. <laughs> um, I knew I'd forget one. Um, that particular set of, look for the other eating disorders too. Um, they all have a similar pattern though. Social isolation, secrecy. Uh, and often having a conversation on an emotional level rather than a, co a cognitive one, using all the, I think is much better. So it's approaching it saying, I am worried rather than, I think there's something wrong with you yeah. mm. is, is a much more powerful place to start irrespective of the eating disorder. Um, and I think you have a lot more traction then because they'll want to help you. A lot of people with eating disorders, wide range, are often very caring folk and they are very emotionally uh, aware. And so mm. they will naturally want to help you. And so by doing that, will be less socially isolated and will help themselves. Um, and Arfid, Arfid. Yeah. <laughs> Children too have eating disorders. <laughs> yeah. Um, you should have gone last because I'm going to plug what's coming up, but I think it's still it's still beneficial to the student community. So um, going back to Food and Me and the, the programme, we have our next webinar coming up um, on the 20th of uh, March and it's at 6.30. And... Um, I'll, we'll leave some resources behind. You can uh, scan the QR code or come on, go onto the website. It's about body image and it's a space for you to listen, to ask questions. Um, and um, if you want to engage in the discussion, we're keen to hear from um, students and young people. Get in touch and um, you can either host a uh, focus group and we'll come to you or you can join um, the advisory group because this service is really about um, transforming, making services um, better serve the communities who wouldn't normally access services when they need it. So yeah. your voice matters. Um, come along, listen, share, and get involved. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, we will have all of the links in our bio when we upload it. Um, we also have student wellbeing here that are here to support you if you do need help. Um, apart from that, thank you so much, both of you, Zoe and Terry, for coming today. It was an absolute pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I think that's that's it. We'll just wrap up there. Just to let everyone know that we still have the Men's Mental Health campaign going on, so you can still join the competition. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Pleasure.